Well, I realize I'm spending a little more time in the Olivet Discourse uh, than probably originally pr planned, but there's so much here that I don't want to just skip over, especially given the probably majority report of end times views in this part of Indiana. We're about 20 minutes away from Grace College, which one of its founders, I believe, Alva, Alva McLean, made a, uh, as, as, a, as a matter of being accepted as a teacher, you had to sign a statement that said you believe in the certain eschatological position. It's premillennial, it's dispensational. We're also not too far from Bethel Publishing in Napanee, I believe, where many of those books were also uh, reproduced. So in this area, everybody kind of assumes, here's how things are gonna play out. And I learned a long time ago that you, you just can't assume everything. You have to constantly be thinking in terms of, I wanna be a Berean, who Paul said was more noble than the Thessalonians, because they examined the scriptures to see that what Paul was saying was actually according to the word of God. I wanna quote John Frame here. Suffering comes first, then glory. But the blood of the martyrs is the seed of a great church. As we look back over 2,000 years of Christian history, it is wonderful to see how divine providence slowly but surely brings triumph out of dark circumstances. The church follows the path of the cross and it shares in the glory of the cross. That's the end of the quote. Now everyone thinks that the time they're living in is the worst. If your primary diet of information is, well, on one hand, Fox News, and the other hand, MSNBC, surely you would think that we're in dark times heretofore unknown. But that shouldn't be our primary source of information. We're standing on the word of God. I'm not saying be ignorant of current events. What I am saying is all of those people have uh, motives and intentions that we can't, we can't uh, try to begin to fathom. And so we, we want to make sure that what we're, what we're really believing about the times we live in are still informed by the Bible. Our history is also fairly narrow. Even with all the information, most of us in this room have, either in your purse or your back pocket, a computer. It's called a smartphone. And with just a couple little tips of your finger, you can access all of the history in all of the world from the very beginning. Go ahead, try it. No, I'm, I'm kidding, you don't try it. But you wanna find out about the, the uh, Tacitus or the wars of the Spartans or of almost anything. All you have to do is look it up, it's right there. So we have more information but less wisdom for some reason. Of course, I'm not talking about present company. You have all the wisdom. Now, I've been emphasizing in this study so far, the Olivet Discourse, verse 34, which we haven't actually gotten to except in reading. Truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. And because that is the clobber passage used by skeptics, I don't want to give them an inch of ground on whether Jesus speaks truth or not, or what he says comes to pass. In fact, I think this is a great em uh, evidence that indeed he was the prophet, because everything he said did come to pass. But that raises the question, though, if, if I'm right about this, and my other fellow post-millennialists are right, the things that Jesus is describing really did fall upon that generation, then what about the signs that Jesus said were going to precede those things happening? Did those signs actually take place? So here's what I want to do. I want to take a run through the passage, through verse 14, and I want to begin to answer those questions. We're not going to conclude it. That'll be next week, Lord willing. And I'm going to be going through. My, my personal opinion is, and that... Again, everybody comes to conclusions. I believe that everything from verse 1 through verse 35 of Matthew 24 has already taken place. That is not in the future. Why do I think that? Well, first of all, the reason to stop there is because 
Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. And he goes on in verse 36, if you look, but of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven nor the son, but the father alone. The Lord Jesus in his incarnation was utterly obedient to the father, completely. When he emptied himself, it doesn't mean he ceased to become, to be God, but he took on a human nature. Verses 1 through 35, Jesus says, here are the signs to look for. And verse 36 and on says, only the Father knows, and there are no signs. Just be ready. You see where I'm going there? It's, it's an exegetical, that is how we interpret the scripture, based on the words of Christ himself. The first half of the chapter, don't be deceived, look for these signs. These are the beginnings of birth pangs. Verse 36 and on, where we go on as it was in the days of Noah, one man threshing and one man taken and so forth. There are no signs for that, none that are given. And he says, no one knows the hour except the Father. So Jesus indeed does know when, quote, all these things are coming, one generation, but in his obedient incarnation, he doesn't know when the final and ultimate second coming judgment will take place. So let's read our passage. That's, that's where I'm coming from, just full disclosure there. Let's read through verse, verse 14. Jesus came out of the temple and was going away when his disciples came up to point out the temple buildings to him. And he said to them, do you not see these things? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. And as he was sitting on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us when will these things happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and of the end of the age? And Jesus answered and said to them, see to it that no one misleads you. For many will come in my name saying, I am the Christ and will mislead many. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened for these things must take place, but that is not yet the end. For nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. And in various places, there will be earthquakes, and famines and earthquakes. But all these things are merely the beginning of birth pangs. Then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. At that time, many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. Because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, then the end will come. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Now this will be extremely fruitful if we're to understand what, what Jesus is emphasizing here. The old is about to be dissolved to make way for the new. As I said last week, you have to have a new wineskin to hold the new wine of the new covenant. You couldn't continue to have a Jewish church for the new covenant because all of those things, we remember in the first century, who was the primary, up to the point of Nero, who was the primary persecutor of Christians? It was the Jews. There was a, there was a movement in the 20th century after World War II, we know what happened, the Holocaust, persecution of uh, ethnically Jewish people, that that emphasis was was softened a bit. In fact, sometimes it was like, you shouldn't say that. That's anti-Semitism. But you read the Bible, it, you know how it is if you're looking for one thing, you're gonna find it. But look through the New Testament as to who were the enemies of the cross of Jesus Christ. It wasn't primarily the Romans. Romans don't care who you worship as long as you worship the emperor too. That was the problem, that's for later. The primary persecutor and enemy of the church were the Jews, the Orthodox Jews. And Jesus has just said that temple that we talked about last week that's so glorious, that cannot remain. Technically, there has been no Judaism 
since 70 AD because there's no temple and there's no place to have sacrifices. So Jesus initially begins here with this warning against deception. He says that many will come in my name. And that's picked up again in, later in verse 24, that's next week, for false Christs and false prophets will arise and will show great signs and wonders so as to mislead, if possible, even the elect. So Jesus is warning them, this is going to happen. Be on the watch. And this is really more about, I don't believe Jesus thinks the disciples are gullible, but it's about the timing. Keep an eye out. Don't be misled. For when you see these fake Jesuses and false prophets and false teachers all claiming to teach in my name, this, these are birth pangs. The baby's about to be delivered, as it were. And indeed, there were many who came in the name of Christ and drew away followers after themselves. And very early in church history, in 1 John 2, 18, what does John write? Children, it is the last hour. Again, that has a, that's some immediacy there. This, this is the last hour. And how does he know this? How does the apostle John know it's the last hour? And just as you heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know it's the last hour. What's he talking about there? It's those teachers that say they're teaching in the name of Jesus, but they're not. They're teaching lies. In AD 36, under Pilate, there arose in the area of Samaria a false prophet, and many people followed him. Again, under the uh, governorship of Phaedus in 45 AD, there was another false messiah. And Joseph, Josephus, the historian, tells us that, quote, the country was full of robbers and magicians, like Simon Magus in the book of Acts, false prophets and false messiahs and imposters who deluded people with promises of great events. As... Uh, I think it was W.C. Field. There's a sucker born every minute. No, that's P.T. Barnum. I'm going to give the right quote. But people are generally, gen, in general, they're gullible, and they're going to follow somebody who can, who can do, do cool things, do great things. So, yeah, there were those who arose in the name of Jesus and led people astray. What about wars and rumors of war? I mean, all through the 70s and 80s, anytime there was a war breakout, Everybody lost their mind and said, see, he's coming back any day. Look, there's another war. Okay, we are humans. We war. It's what we do. During this time frame, though, between uh, Christ's first advent and the crucifixion, his ascension, and AD 70, there were a whole lot of wars, especially in the Roman Empire, which, by the way, that would have been the world. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. There were conflicts between tribes, between tribes and the Romans, in Germany and Thrace and Gaul and Armenia and all over the empire, especially in this area of Palestine. It was, it was known as the Jewish-Roman War. Anti-Roman sentiment was building and building all through this generation between about 30 AD. I say about because we're talking about, in general, a generation but exactly August of 70, there's all kinds of records of that event. We're going to get to that. But there was this general dislike and growing hatred of the Roman occupation. One of the, one of the main things that drove that was that the emperor Caligula demanded that all religions should put a statue of him in their worship center. It's, it's, it's almost like the pinch of incense, but even worse. It would, it, would be, it would be like an abomination in the temple. That sounds familiar, doesn't it? And it really, really was so unpleasant to the, to the Jews that they decided that they were going to rebel with violence. Yeah, that, that, that political move did not go over very well with the populace. And... 
What prevented the war from starting right then was the fact that he died before he could enforce it. And then another emperor took his place. In 66 AD, the great Jewish revolt started. And at the time, the governor was Florus because what he did was he, he took some money from the temple, 17 talents of silver. Doesn't sound like that much, but it was an, it was an outrage. We will not take this. And this resulted in a protest and then later in a riot by the Jewish people. And afterwards, he allowed one of his underlings to plunder certain sections of Jerusalem. You know, they were always, they always needed more money. You realize all of these stimulus tech checks aren't being paid for with taxes. They're just printing it, but it's tax on your savings, so you know that, right? They couldn't just do that because they were still dealing in silver. This was before they learned to debase the coins. You know, they'd get a whole bunch of silver, melt it all down, add the same amount of nickel to it, and you'd end up with twice as much money, but it wasn't as valuable because it's not all silver. So the Romans were always coming up with schemes. One of the easiest things you could do is have your legion go into Jerusalem, trumped up charge, and confiscate a whole bunch of money. It works so well. But what happened was it set off a general revolt. And in 68 AD, after the beast Nero killed himself, civil war broke out in the entire empire. There, who's the emperor? No one really knew because everyone was vying for position. I mean, uh, a, a man named Galba was proclaimed emperor from Spain and then he entered into Rome, but he was murdered. Then Otho succeeded him. At the same time, a man named Vitellus was proclaimed the emperor in, in Bavaria, Germany. And then Otho commits suicide. And Vespasian, Vespasian sorry, then invaded Italy, took the throne, and they call that the year of the four emperors. What years were those? 68 and 69 AD. This was a huge crisis period. And it was finally resolved when Vespasian put down all contenders for the throne. So indeed, what Jesus said was, wars and rumors of wars, nation rising up against nation. That is ethnos rising against ethnos, people group against people group, even internally. So there was all kinds of these signs that you could observe that the birth pangs have started. What's the next one? Various places, earthquakes and famines. Every time there was an earthquake, well, that's, that's it. He's coming back any, any second now because there was an earthquake in Brazil. Well, here's the thing. History and scripture itself records local and empire-wide famines all through this time period. Um, you can look at Acts 11.28 where the prophet Agabus, quote, stood up and began to indicate by the Spirit that there would certainly be a great famine all over the world. And Luke goes on to tell us when that was. That was during the reign of Claudius. And then other historians, Josephus, Suetonius, Tacitus, all record, record earthquakes throughout the empire in Crete, Miletus, remember where Paul went to uh, meet with the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, Laodicea from Revelation, Colossae, where with the book of Colossians, all of these places had earthquakes. And remember, the collections in the churches to help the saints in Jerusalem was because there was a famine in Jerusalem. So let's pool our resources and help our fellow brothers out. So all of this is taking place as the New Testament is being written. <clears throat> so Jesus goes on then in verse 8, but all these things are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. He says, these signs aren't the real thing. These signs are pointing to the real thing. And then they will deliver you to tribulation and they will kill you and you'll be hated by all nations because of my name. Birth pangs. This is what this whole thing is about. This week and next week are birth pangs. And I have never experienced giving birth because I am a man. I thought you would notice that. These days, hey, we live in strange and troubled times where 
People don't know this stuff. But I have witnessed these birth pangs. I've been there. And it's something else. It's, you can't stop it. Once that process starts, oh, you can, you can give her an epidural or something, but it's going to happen. It's all, it's begun. No, it's like no power on heaven and earth is going to stop this baby from coming out. I love what Vody Bauckham said. We need to stop calling giving birth a miracle. It goes, happens all the time, every day. In fact, yep, right there, another, another birth, just like the sun rising. It is a glorious and miraculous event. Who, who could believe that this world we live in is a cosmic accident if you've ever been there in the room and the baby comes out? Look at that. A woman can make people. This is great. But as part of the curse, pain was increased in the giving of birth. And, and so everyone now knows what this birth pangs, labor. Why, why is it called labor? Oh, it's hard work. You know, I get a slight cold and I'm on the sofa. Oh, you don't know the horrors I'm going through. The old commentator's Bible says this, though. The tribulations and calamities which preceded and accompanied the overthrow of the Jewish polity, that is the Jewish world, serve as a sign and warning of the great and universal woes which will herald the day of judgment. See, even, even those guys recognized that this was horrible on a level we, we can't comprehend. And we'll talk about next week where he says, tribulation as has never occurred or never will occur. Matthew Henry says, bad as things were with them, there are worse behind. In other words, as bad as the birth pangs are, it doesn't result in a glorious birth. It resulted in utter destruction. I suppose the analogy could be carried forth that the new covenant is completely and utterly free of all influence of the Judaizers, but here's the thing. He goes on in verse 10, at that time many will fall away and betray one another and hate one another. This is what happens when, when fake Christians are persecuted since they don't really believe this stuff, they will turn their friends in. And sadly, even some real Christians have too. Many false prophets will arise and mislead many because lawlessness is increased. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. Now, that's a truism anyway, right? I mean, we can apply that now. You want to finish well, those of you with gray hair, those of you with graying hair, those of you who are coloring over your gray hair. And those of you who don't need anything because you're still kids, all right? The Bible says that if you endure to the end, you will be saved. It doesn't necessarily mean that your salvation is utterly dependent on your endurance. It's a truism. Those who endure are Christians. Those who don't are not. And there was an awful lot of persecution that went on even in the Bible. Scripture itself is replete with many accounts of persecutions. Just for a sampling, I'm just going to read a few here. Acts 12, 1 and 2. Herod the king laid hands on some that belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with the sword. Acts 14, 19. Jews came from Antioch and Iconium. Having won over the crowds, they stoned Paul and dragged him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. That's persecution. Acts 20, 29 and 30. I know that after my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And from among your own selves, men will arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after themselves. And Paul speaks of these false apostles in 2 Corinthians eleven thirteen. Such men are false, false apostles, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. All of these things are taking place from the time of Christ's ascension to the time when all of these things end up coming upon Jerusalem. And it continued to go on and on and on. In 2 Timothy 3, we're, we're warned, 
in the last days. What are the last days? According to Hebrews, it was going on when that book was written. And it says, so that these men who oppose the truth, men of depraved mind, rejected in regard to the faith. They're rejected, but they keep on teaching people. And now I like the next verse. He goes, but they will not make further progress for their folly will be obvious to all. That gives us hope. So yeah, there were many that came in the name of Christ. These are the signs that the disciples were to look for. For, what did he say? Not one stone be left on the temple. Now, if you're reading along and you've seen any type of teaching on this, many have said, well, that couldn't possibly be true because the gospel hasn't gone to the whole world yet. There are still unreached people groups for Jesus. We, we used to support missionaries to Tanzania and New Guinea, heard exploits of headhunters and you know, from guys that I know would come back and tell us, well, these people are crazy because there's no gospel. They still eat each other. Okay, verse 14. This gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all the nations, then the end will come. Let's notice something first of all. In John 3, 16, God so loved the world... Do you remember what the Greek word is for world there? It's cosmos. And in John's writing, as we went through the Gospel of John, we noticed that there were many semantic ranges, that is to say, many ways that the word world is used. It's not always the same thing. For example, God loved the world in this way that he sent Christ so that the believers wouldn't perish. But then in 1 John, the same apostle writing, saying, do not love the world or anything in the world. Does he mean the same thing? No. He's talking about that bad ethical system of greed and avarice and backbiting and, and all that. Where the word for world here isn't even cosmos. It's, it's the word oikomene. Oikomene. And it, it means the land... Generally, sometimes it would be used to speak of the land of inheritance in the, in the Greek Old Testament. But most of the time it was used to specify the Roman Empire, the Oikomene. And Gary DeMar says it, it's better translated as the known world. In these cases, it refers to the political boundaries of the Roman Empire. So he says the gospel of this, this kingdom is going to be proclaimed to the world as a testimony to the nations. So he's not talking about reaching the Apaches in our hemisphere or even the Hindus in India. He's talking about the Oikomene, the, the empire. The second point here is the gospel will have been witnessed to the nations. The Roman Empire was made up of many, many, many nations. And as we heard last week... When, when Peter preached the first real evangelistic sermon in Acts chapter 2 at the Feast of Pentecost, I can't remember how many, how many nations were represented by the Jews that came from all over the empire. It's like 14 or 16, I can't remember. I fault me on my old age, but there was a lot. And then third, this is actually what the Bible says at the end of the apostolic age. That began in Acts 2, and in just one day, one afternoon, well, here it is. I had it in my notes the whole time. Well, okay, in one day, here's how many nations were testified to by the gospel. Parthians and Medes and Elamites, Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, the districts of Libya around Cyrene, Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretans, those from the island of Crete, and Arabs. That's just one day. So the gospel had been witnessed to those nations. And Paul alludes to this, this task, as being completed when he writes in Romans 10, 18, but I ask, have they not heard? Indeed they have, for quote, 
Their voice has gone out into all the earth and their words to the ends of the world. And in Colossians chapter 1, he says, The gospel which has come to you, as indeed in the whole world, is bearing fruit and increasing. That's verses 5 and 6. And then in Colossians 1, 23, quote, If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven and of which I, Paul, have become a minister. So according to the New Testament's own conclusions and definitions, this sign had been done by the end of the apostolic age, when Paul is writing his letters. Now this doesn't mean there aren't still groups to, to proclaim the gospel to. We're, what we're trying to do is compare scripture with scripture <clears throat> and use its own terminology when determining whether this sign took place before AD 70 or not. That's the point. This is how they wrote and understood the common terminology of the day. It would be, it would be like us demanding of the Bible a strict 24-hour day based on our clocks when that's not what they were talking about. Many times that have, that's led to confusion about the timing of the crucifixion, you know, the third hour, sixth hour, all of these things. We don't say that. We say 10.30. Be there at the third hour. When do you mean? Oh, I'm sorry. Six. That's a little early. Can we make it eight? You know. So last week I made this statement that some dispensationalists, in fact, most insist that Matthew 24 is ultimately talking about the climactic second coming of Christ and the last judgment, even if Luke in Luke 21 isn't talking about the climactic second coming and last judgment, in his version of the Olivet Discourse, and that all of this, what I just said, verses 1 through 35, is meant to be predicting multiple thousands of years in the future from the disciples' hearing. And they even say that the destruction of the temple that Jesus is speaking here isn't of that temple, but of a rebuilt temple in the future. It's not the one that's standing at the disciples that, hey, Jesus, look at the town. They said, no, it's not that one. I disagree a thousand percent. And the thing is, it's not that we're not taking this literally. I believe we are. Oftentimes that's the charge. Literally means according to the literalis, according to the sense of the scripture. And I want to quote Gary DeMar here. He, he articulates this very well. He says this, We compare Scripture with Scripture. We let the Bible interpret the Bible. There were literal earthquakes and literal famines, just as Jesus predicted. Paul tells us that the gospel literally had been preached throughout the whole world and to all nations and all creation under heaven, as I just read, just as Jesus predicted. Then there are Jesus' specific words that the literal temple that the disciples ask him about would be destroyed before the last apostle died and before that first century generation had passed away. That's literal. That's really what happened. Now I'm planning on finishing this Olivet Discourse next week and cover the, the tribulation it says there will be great tribulation. The rest of the signs that point to this. So I'm going to leave verses 15 through 35 because it's, we're done. Let me key in on this just for a second. Verse 11, many false prophets will arise and will mislead many because lawlessness is increased. Most people's love will grow cold, but the one who endures to the end, he will be saved. This had direct relevance on those disciples in the first century and it also has direct relevance in application to us 21st century disciples too. Remember that device I mentioned in your purse or your back pocket? Well, that functions in many ways like the printing press did at the time of the Reformation. It gives us the ability to access and create a whole lot of information without oversight. Now, I think that's a good thing. The downside is that people are gullible, and there's almost anyone under the planet can publish themselves, 
can come up with their own podcast, their own network. You can do a couple graphics and look like you know what you're doing. All it takes is some good lighting. It's not that hard. And at the time of the Reformation, the, the Roman Catholic Church was opposed to the printing press. Well, why? Because it allows men like Martin Luther to publish anything he wants. We need to be Bereans. We need to examine the text, know your Bible, know why you believe what you believe. Because there are all kinds of people out there who are still vying for allegiance when it comes to the faith. And they will flatter. They will try to connect dots where they really shouldn't be connected or leave some dots unconnected that should. My friend last night said, yeah, it just gets confusing. I, I, I said, I recommend you, you listen to so-and-so. Well, I mentioned Vody Bauckham. I like Vody. He's, he's solid and he's also engaging and funny, so that helps me. And he was kind of ready to, I, don't, I just don't listen to any podcast or whatever. I said, no, no, no. Look, how, do you know your Bible? Do you know your own assumptions? Are you willing to examine what you believe in light of this scripture and scripture and scripture? I think most Christians should be. I mean, all Christians should be. I don't know how many are, though. And we just, if I say something from here that, that you're going, no, that's not adding up. Well, the best way to try to figure out if I'm an idiot is to ask questions it's possible that I had a bad fried egg that morning and I'm not thinking straight. It's possible. Even the Apostle Paul said, I want to commend these guys because they went back to the text and examined what I said in light of the scriptures. Well, we need to absolutely do that. One more thing. Um, TBN, the, the network with all the preachers on it, can I, nah, let's, let's turn those guys off. They're, they're going to lie to you. I will, I will go on record as saying the vast majority of the people that are on TBN are not telling the truth. However, there are still a lot of folks out there that you have to be careful. Just like in the first century. Now, I'm not saying that these false teachers are a sign of the end like Jesus was. All I'm saying is we need to be on guard Make sure that what we're taking in, our diet, especially theologically, is sound. And oftentimes you're going to end up going, well, I think, I think this is what the text says. God help me, here I stand, right? Like Luther. So as we continue this study and, and going through, um, if, if you don't end up agreeing with, with uh, my position, that's okay. Uh, again, like I said early on, membership in this church isn't dependent on your view of the last things, nor is membership in the Southern Baptist Convention dependent on your view. But I do want you to study to show yourself approved and understand these things so that when people come up and say Jesus was a false prophet because this stuff didn't happen, you've got an answer for them, all right? All right, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for your word and we thank you for the promises of, of the covenant we thank you that you never lie and that we can trust you utterly and completely, infinitely, everything that you've said. Now, Lord, strengthen us for the task of discipling others and being discipled ourselves. I pray that you'll be gracious unto us. You will continue to convict us of our sin, bring us into repentance so that we can uh, face a world that's dying and lost without you with confidence and boldness with the gospel of Jesus Christ. We thank you and give you all the glory in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.